tonight's going to be so easy for me because I can just hand over to Claire, who is going to be looking at how lifestyle and nutrition can help with our menopause. And she's going to nag me because I don't have any water with me tonight. Oh, shock horror. That's at least five minutes of the oncoming talk. <laughs> Maybe more. <laughs> I just said that realize. a bit of poor mine. Yeah, she's going to be telling me off. So, with no further ado, um, this is our last positive living, by the way. Um, but we've had lots of people asking if we're going to continue them. So, we are thinking of making them a monthly, monthly what? A monthly event. Um, and we hope to see you all there. And if you've had any feedback, please just ping us a message either on Twitter or over on info at positivity.co.uk because we'd love to hear what you've thought, what you've enjoyed, what you haven't. Be nice, please. Constructive criticism always. <laughs> and with that, I will hand you over to Claire. Thank you. Well, I think those of you that have attended more than one will know who I am anyway. Um, I'm also a nutritional therapist, um, menopause health coach, member of the British Menopause Society and anything and all things menopause. Um, I'm often asked why I do what I do. And the reason for that is in my 30s, um, straight after having my second child, my hormones never actually settled down and went back to, well, I don't know if they were ever normal, but I went back to what they were pre-children anyway. Um, and I got fobbed off for quite a long while with, you know, well, it's your baby hormones, they'll settle down. But things didn't settle down. And to cut a really long story short, I saw seven doctors in seven years who fobbed me off often with um, different um prescriptions for different symptoms that I might have been presenting not once not once in those seven years did one of them consider it to be hormonal um but then neither did I um I was in my 30s and this is the days before Dr Google so um I was I was definitely very very ignorant anyway it transpired that alongside these weird and wonderful symptoms of brain fog anxiety uh, the first ever um, panic attacks, the only two panic attacks I've ever had. Um, the, the anxiety, the mood swings, the incredible anger that um, I would experience. I was also having stomach pains. Um, so grasping the nettle, I saw somebody privately who uh, let me know that I was definitely quite a long way in the menopause um, transition and suggested the increasing stomach pains were due to endometriosis. So off back to the doctors, number eight, um, and um, presented them with this report and said, you know, what are you going to do about it? Uh, and their and you know what their first question, the first question that GP asked me was, um, do you have private health insurance because you'll not get a hysterectomy on the NHS at your age? So I fortunately I did. Um, and then age 39, I had um, a full hysterectomy because the endometriosis was so bad and that threw me into a full menopause. Um, and I slept on an HRT patch until I was 51. Um, but during that time, intervening time, I was fairly convinced that I'd contributed towards my own problems with the lifestyle that I had. So I determined to go out and find out what I could do um, to help myself. Why did I come off HRT often asked? And um, that is because it was the early 2000s and um, the research at the time suggested that staying on HRT for any length of time was going to contribute to chances of having breast cancer. So I chose to put into practice all the training and nutrition and everything else that I'd learned um, and, and weaned myself off the HRT and not wanting anyone else to suffer as I did, that's why I do what I do. And anything I can possibly do to stop someone struggling as I did and hearing the struggles that other women have as well to help them as much as they can effortlessly or more effortlessly trans, uh, get through this transition is, is good news to me. So I've put together a slide. It's not just about nutrition. 
Um, it's also about lifestyle. And I'm hoping that you'll get a couple of aha moments from it. And also that um, you'll have some questions which I'll answer at the end. Okay, so let's get this show on the road. Here I am looking like a leprechaun. Um, yeah, don't I just. Right, um, yeah, let's keep going. So first thing I'd like to share with you is that um, nutrition and lifestyle changes that you make during any time of life actually, but particularly during the menopause years, opportunity to um, create the benefits that taking HRT does too. However, it takes a lot more effort and it takes a lot more commitment, um, but the benefits are really fantastic. And whether you're taking HRT or not, and I'm not an HRT um, basher, I've taken it myself in the past, uh, whether you're taking it or not, then I really do highly recommend that you embrace everything that I'm going to be sharing with you today. So let's look at some of the benefits of uh, nutrition and lifestyle for menopause and health. Firstly, it can pre definitely prevent or calm unpleasant symptoms. It can reduce the severity and it can reduce the frequency. And what I'm going to share with you tonight will um, help you do just that. The positive benefits are on across all levels, the physical, your mental and your emotional health. Um, so it's certainly something that really, really worth um, considering doing. Um, Making those changes give you back a sense of control through all these this chaotic and confusing time. You know, it's so easy to give our power away at times and let someone else take responsibility for our health. Um, but doing something, something really, really simple, uh, can give us back that sense of control and that empowers us to make further changes to help ourselves uh, through any time of life, but particularly through the menopause. Um, and the changes promote optimum health, both now and beyond menopause, helping you reduce your risks of cancer and diabetes, osteoporosis, uh, dementia and cardiovascular disease. So I hope I've given you enough reason to take note of what I'm gonna be saying tonight um, and to start making some positive change in your own life too. Um, so I must remind you, of course, that menopause is a natural phase of life um, and you may need to tweak your nutrition or lifestyle to be able to um, cope with this better. But a couple of things, we are ever-changing beings and we need to adjust appropriately and that might require constant change as we make tweaks. And also, you know, there's nothing we can do about the decline in hormones. They are, it's going to happen. Um, all we can do is help that those chaotic hormones decline in a much more effortless or less effortless, no, more effortless manner. Uh, anyway, a much easier way anyway. So um, here I am talking to you very, very briefly, and it has to be brief because I could talk for a very long time on this subject, about the positive choices that you can make with regard to lifestyle and, and um, nutrition. And these are just two of the seven modules covered in my natural menopause roadmap. And as I said, it really doesn't matter if you're on HRT or choosing to follow a drug-free route. This information will help you create your optimum health both now um, throughout, throughout menopause and beyond. And the most important message I'd like to get over you, to you today is one of self-care, uh, say of taking responsibility for your own health, not totally relying on something or someone else to make this menopause transition as, um, make this menopause transition easy for you. With that in mind, I'm going to start off by sharing the single most hormone disruptor there is uh, ever, and that is stress. Uh, the changes you can make to your lifestyle and nutrition can really, really help combat the negative effect on your hormones, that stress. Um, but yeah, I was going to say that stress creates, but it doesn't really create it. It actually just exaggerates 
um, it and you'll find out a little bit more about that too. So without going into a load of science, um, as your adrenal glands start to um, reduce their uh, production of oestrogen, no, of your ovaries start to reduce the production of oestrogen, your adrenal glands um, take over. And um, there is a hierarchy um, within the adrenal glands that helps support the, produc the uh, production of progesterone, testosterone and oestrogen. The three hormones that you most commonly associate with menopause. But I'd just like to share how this ha um, cascade happens because that's really, really relevant to um, the symptoms that you may be experiencing. So um, cholesterol is not a bad guy. We all do need cholesterol um, and cholesterol is actually a hormone as well. And from cholesterol is manufactured, for want of a better word, a mother ho hormone that we call pregnenolone. And it's important to remember that the production of pregnenolone declines 60% with age. Coming off pregnenolone, so in other words, pregnenolone feeds these two arms. On one arm, it nurtures, feeds and nurtures progesterone. Below that is cortisol, which is your stress hormone. On the other arm is a hormone called DHEA. We're not going to go into that now, but just please take note that that also declines with age to 80 to 90%. And beneath DHEA is testosterone and oestrogen. Now, we don't have many saber-toothed tigers leaping out of the bushes at us nowadays. Um, that is what we would call an acute stress, something that happens short term and surprises us. Um, it may not be a saber-toothed tiger, but it might be a double-decker bus or steaming down the road towards you, or it could be next door's dog going to, you know, bite your ankles. Um, but the same response happens in the body, regardless of whether it's an acute stress, like I've just described, or a chronic long-term stress. And a chronic long-term stress tends to revolve around um, work, relationships, children, aging parents, in money, you know, all those things that we call, and COVID now, all those things that we call life. And life has the same effect by a chemical change on the body, in the body, whether it's an acute, um, yeah, whether it's an acute stress or a life stress, external stress, chronic stress, it has the same biochemical change in the body. And cortisol, therefore, has first priority because cortisol is there to keep us alive. It's our fight or flight um, hormone. It's the, and it cannot differentiate between the saber-toothed tiger and your children having a tantrum or having an argument with your partner or worrying about money or you know worrying about keeping your job. Cortisol has first call. So Cortisol, therefore, has first call on the mother hormone pregnenolone, which leaves insufficient to nurture progesterone, DHEA, testosterone and oestrogen. hope that makes sense to you, explaining to the, that to you verbally. Now, the symptoms of the decline of, or of pregnenolone nurturing those hormones that we're more familiar with are these. So I'd just like you to have a look at these and go through them and ask yourself, are these really the symptoms of chronic stress or are they the symptoms of menopause? Or should I rephrase that? Could these symptoms of chronic stress be attributed to menopause? Or I'll rephrase it again. Are the symptoms of menopause on this list exaggerated um, or heightened or more severe or more frequent because you are living in a constant state of stress? So, having looked at that, 
I'd like to share with you that these external stresses, everything that's on this list creates an internal stress and it keeps your cortisol bar, your stress bar, really resonating at a very high level. And so doing something to reduce the level of that stress bar can really help reduce the symptoms of um, menopause that you are experiencing. In fact, they can actually banish the symptoms of, experience, um, of menopause that you might be experiencing. So let's have a look at how you can help yourself there. Let's learn how to stress less. Um, it sounds like one of those armchairs, doesn't it? I'd love one of those. Yeah, I really would like one of those. Anyway, there are some really simple stress less um, exercises that you can practice. Uh, and there's some, I'm going to give you some examples here and you can very easily find your own. But what I love about these is not one of them costs money. There's no investment in money here. Um, there is only an investment in your time. So let's have a, a quick look at those. Um, do your breath focus or focusing on your breath is possibly the most powerful um, tool, the most powerful technique that you can put into practice. So easy to do. You can do it absolutely anywhere. No one can, will perhaps even notice that you're doing it. But when you feel that those anxiety levels rise, when you feel the stress rise, even when you feel the start of a hot flush coming on or a mood swing um, or any other symptom that might be really concerning you, then just take a long, slow, deep breath from your belly. Use your belly here. Don't use your um, diaphragm to, uh, or upper body to actually do that um, breath. And certainly don't see your um, shoulders going up and down, becoming ear, you know, ear, getting closer and closer to your ears and becoming earrings. So you have to use your belly here. And I know that can be, we as women, we're often used to walking around holding our belly in and make us, you know, look slimmer. But here you just have to let it all hang out and use your belly. Um, and this is just long, slow, deep breaths in and long, slow, deep breaths out. Four or five times, however long it takes until you really start to notice the level of your stress um, bar coming down. Another technique which is really simple to do, and you can do this sitting down or lying down, um, is um, a technique that blends your breath focus on progressive muscle relaxation. So basically, if you're sat down or even lying down, just start at your feet, wiggle your toes, uh, clench them and then relax them. Just work up your body to your calves, clench your calf muscles and consciously re relax them all the while doing slow breathing. Up the body, through your hips, through your torso, down your arms, relax those shoulders. There's so much tension held there. Into your neck as well, there's so much tension held there. And even your scalp, and just breathe and relax. That too will help bring down your stress bar. For some people, guided imagery works. Um, mindfulness med meditation uh, helps others too. Loads of apps that you can download for free to use here. Yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong. You don't have to go to a class to do this. You can access YouTube videos now, which is really so helpful. Um, spending time with friends, an absolute must here. Uh, and that, I mean, it's really difficult at the moment, isn't it, to know whether we should or we shouldn't actually spend time with friends or not. But at least stay in contact with them, communicate with them via phone, via FaceTime, via WhatsApp, um, Facebook, Twitter, or whatever. Find a way to keep that communication um, maintained. It's one of our basic human needs to communicate with people. So do keep that up, it really does help you psychologically. Um, I'll come back to prioritize yourself. Exercise wisely, you don't have to go and pound the streets um, for hours on an end, hours on end. You don't have to join an expensive gym or invest in, um, in Lycra. Um, it's exercising wisely and, and frequently and consistently. Um, so going out in the fresh air is fantastic for, um, 
for reducing your stress bar. Even just a gentle stroll around um, the block or through the park or in the woods or whatever. Um, but exercise wisely. We don't have to pound the streets, which can actually raise that um, stress bar. And have a jolly good laugh because they do, you know, laughter is the best medicine. Um, and it, it is true. Put yourself in front of your favorite comedian on catch up TV or something and, and just have a jolly good laugh. But all of these things involve you prioritizing yourself. And I know how difficult that is. You know, as women, we're remarkably good at spinning the plates, um, keeping everybody and everything else going and at the detriment to our own health. There should be no guilt in sparing just 10 minutes a day for any one of these examples I've given you or any one that you find that works for you yourself. Just 10 minutes a day of you time. You are worth it. And also the people that you love deserve for you to be able to function better in the world too. So I know it's difficult and I know you might start with good intentions and I know they might go on for a few days, but then you forget. Please bring yourself back constantly to giving yourself 10 minutes of me time a day and having a jolly good laugh. So how else can you reduce this stress bar? We've got the um, stress and the severity and frequency of symptoms. Well, you have some examples here. You can have your own. But the same in, um, internal stress can be helped by embracing some uh, very simple nutrition uh, changes too. So I am going to share that with you now. Uh, I am a great believer one too many. So um, definitely starting off with adequate hydration. Adequate hydration, I can't get my words out, adequate hydration um, promotes a healthy digestive um, tract mucus, which is so essential for the absorption of nutrients. And this mucus membrane is also the good earth for the good bacteria in your gut to proliferate. It's your microbiome. Um, and it's this microbiome that plays an intrinsic part in helping balance your hormones. So looking after your gut is of paramount importance. Adequate hydration also helps with mental clarity. Your brain is 80% water and every electrical impulse in your body, um, these impulses um, that control memory and personality, hormone regulation, senses and more, um, all function over water. So it's vitally, vitally important that you have an adequate supply of water in your body. And being hydrated can help reduce your hot flushes too. So please do look to drink at least two to two and a half litres of plain water a day. Um, and at the right time to help your digestion in particular. If I, if I was going to give you um, uh, the most important time to drink water during the day, I would say it's upon waking. Have a large glass of body temperature or room temperature water with a slice of lemon in. It really, really does set you up for the day. Oh, perhaps I should put you on the right slide. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, the best plans of mice and men and all things. So omega-3s, now this is the second of my foundation stones with water being the first. These have to be in place to get the best results from any cha other nutrition changes you might make. So omega-3s are found in oily fish like mackerel, salmon, tr trout, tuna, sardines and pilchards. Um, and omega-3s are the raw ingredients that are needed to nurture hormones. I see them as like the apples for the apple pie. So your hormones are the apple pie. And to make a good apple pie, you need a decent, good supply, plentiful supply um, of apples. And omega-3s are the apples to your hormonal ap apple pie. Um, they help nurture all, all your hormones, including uh, reducing your cortisol bar, helping with anxiety and all those other symptoms that we looked at a little bit earlier. 
Research also shows that they help, the prevent, help to prevent the occurrence of postmenopausal breast cancer, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease by lowering triglycerides. Um, and they're referred to as an essential fatty acid. It's not yet known if the body can manufacture it itself, um, and it is truly essential for life and health. So it is essential that you reach out and you find sources of um, omega-3s. In fact, if you don't like the fish or any of the um, sources that I've mentioned, I, I'm not going to go into supplements today, but this is the one supplement I would recommend for everyone to take. And the next one is fibre. It's really important for maintaining your digestive health again. And I'm hoping you're beginning to realise how important digestive health and nurturing those good bacteria are for your hormones. Um, it helps keep you regular and by doing so helps remove old oestrogens and hormones from the body. Good fibre is found in whole grain produce, in fruits and berries, vegetables, peas, beans, pulses, nuts and seeds. Um, and you should be eating a wide range of these for maximum nutrient value. Uh, the next one is calcium rich foods, so important for bone, teeth and heart health. Um, again, look to nuts and seeds, the oily fish that I previously mentioned, and the highest source is actually in seaweeds. I know every time I mention this, everybody's eyebrows go up to meet the forehead. Um, so seaweeds like nori or wakame flakes, uh, you can buy these in most supermarkets and I use them sprinkled instead of salt. So I know that I'm getting a good supply um, of, um, uh, of calcium. So you may be thinking here, why haven't, she, well, why hasn't she mentioned dairy? This is a huge subject on, on its own, but briefly, and very briefly, number one, it is true that dairy is full of calcium, but on its own, it doesn't have sufficient cofactor nutrients to allow for the maximum absorption and utilization in the human body. It should be taken in addition, uh, the calcium should be in addition to a natural and varied diet that must include magnesium, potassium, vitamin D, K2, uh, and also vitamin C. So really, Cow's milk is made to, for baby cows to go from very small to very large in a very quick space of time. So just to go back to reassert the fact that uh, dairy is full of calcium, but it's not really absorbable and utilizable calcium or highly absorbable and utilizable for the human body. To get number two, to get the very best value of the nutrients from dairy produce, please eat full fat because it's the fat that contains the nutrients and helps with that absorption. So please don't go, you know, oh, you know, I'm avoiding all high fat stuff um, uh, because I'm on a diet. A bit like the omega-3s, these are good fats and just have a small amount of, um, of dairy in your diet but do keep, make sure it's the full fat. And number three, if I, were if I were to recommend anything to be organic, I would suggest dairy because our animals are not kept to the highest of standards. Um, and also number four, keep dairy produce to a minu minimum uh, as it can be mucus forming and many people are actually intolerant to it. Um, phytoestrogens, uh, these are a natural compound found in plants and plant-based foods. When they're eaten, they may affect a person in the same way as estrogens do in the body, but their effect is much, much we weaker. Um, and you may have actually heard that they do help with symptoms. Um, okay, so let me go a little bit further with this, um, but very, very briefly to answer a question that I think might be coming up in the mind of people who say, you know, that they are intolerant to estrogens or they're avoiding estrogens for any reason. There are two types of estrogen receptors throughout the body, alpha and beta, and phytoestrogens work by blocking the alpha receptors, stimulating the beta receptors that protect you from breast and womb cancers, yet keep your brain and bones healthy. 
uh, and they also help the liver detoxify and remove old estrogens. Um, it's complicated, basically, and it doesn't have to be, and I am going to make it a little easier for you in a second. Um, some people ask me, you know, about isoflavones or lignans. These are just types of phytoestrogens. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about, I'll focus on phytoestrogens a bit more in the next slide. But having said what I said about fiber and calcium rich food and phytoestrogens, um, etc., my final recommendation here is for you to eat natural produce. And that's the produce that nature provides for you in the form that nature provides for it. So that basically means avoiding the central aisles of the supermarket where all the processed chemical laden foods are. Um, and the, you know, doing so will very, very quickly, and I, I could say easily within a week, um, help you with symptom reduction, uh, the severity and frequency of, um, with um, your energy, uh, give you a boost to energy and provide more restful sleep and much more. Um, so yes, uh, eat natural produce in a wide range of colours uh, and as much of it as you possibly can. So that keeps that fairly simple, I think. Uh, and my top tip here would be to keep a log of your water intake. Make sure that you're having that two to two and a half litres a day of pure water. Yeah, of just a pure clean water. Just want to do a bit of a focus on the phyto with you. Um, these are common sources of phytoestrogens. Um, the one that you may most be most familiar with are the soybeans and soil products. Just want to give you a little bit of a um, recommendation here. Please ensure that the soil products or any soil products that you choose to take are non-genetically modified i.e. they are organic. 96-97% of the food soya is um, genetically modified. It's used an awful lot in food processing. Um, and um, I, I would just be careful here because some research suggests that an excess of genetically modified soya products can actually um, affect the thyroid and if the thyroid is out, then your other endocrine glands and hormones may also be out and struggling. So yeah, here's a simple list of um, uh, um, phytoestrogens for you, uh, and including a couple of herbs, which are the licorice root, which I love, um, and the red clover. So I mentioned what I like to encourage you to include staying positive, uh, but there has to be a downside. Oh, and remind me um, to mention something about phytoestrogens on the next slide. I'll remind myself. <laughs> so there is always an avoidance. Now, I'm not saying stop completely, but I would certainly say keep these to a minimum. And certainly with the first two, find the level that works for you. So you are unique on this journey. Your journey is going to be, and you may know this already, you may have found this out already, your journey is going to be very, very unique from your friend's journey, your mother's journey, your sister's, cousin's, aunt, or anybody else that you know. You may find that um, so other people you know can have six, seven, eight cups of caffeine a day and have absolutely no side effects whatsoever. Um, they don't have an increase in hot flushes, they sleep like a baby, um, but that might not be the same for you. Caffeine is known to contribute towards hot flushes and to disturb sleep. So you have to find out what the right level is for you. Most people can cope with two cups of caffeine a day without any detrimental effect. Um, so with the caffeine and the alcohol here, I'm going to recommend that you keep a hot flush diary or a sleep diary or combine the two really um, and find out what your level of caffeine is to um, avoid the hot flushes and negative sleep. So I mentioned in the previous slide about 
having um, two litres of water a day and recommending that you wake up every morning to a large glass of body temperature or room temperature water with a slice of lemon in. Um, that is what you should wake up for every morning. You should not be waking up to a caffeine hit. You might think that it's going to get you through the day. You might feel that it's going to get you through the day. But all it does is whack up that cortisol bar and will contribute to, to greater severity and frequency of menopause symptoms. So keep it to a minimum. Pretty much the same with alcohol. Alcohol challenges your liver. Your liver an has an integral role in managing hormones in your body and excreting old hormones. Contributes to all symptoms, hot flushes, weight gain uh, and poor sleep. Might help you go to sleep quicker, but the odds are you're going to wake up between one and three o'clock in the morning. Um, I said I would share something with you, uh, some good news about some alcohol. So red wine actually contains a phytoestrogen called resvesterol. Um, so the odd glass of red wine, you can actually argue, is going to be good for your hormones. <laughs> Um, if I was going to recommend anything to avoid and really, really, really keep to a minimum, it would be the refined sugars and carbs. It's the um, it, it's anything that's pretty much white or beige, um, and again found in the centre aisles of the supermarket. It's the excess of it that's causing so much disruption to your hormones. Um, it's contributing towards diabetes um, and weight gain, you know, the incidence of diabetes raises quite significantly post-menopause and post-menopausal women. It affects your, uh, your mood, it affects you mentally and emotionally. And it's so easy to include in the diet without even thinking about it. So a cereal for breakfast, sandwich for lunch, um, pasta or pizza for tea, uh, when I'm doing food diaries with people, th this is not an uncommon scenario. And that is definitely an excess of refined sugars and carbohydrates. And finally, processed foods. Again, back to the central aisles of the supermarket. They contain um, chemicals that are hormone disruptors. And an excess of those will, um, again, lead to an increase in severity and frequency of symptoms and keep that uh, stress, that cortisol stress bar resonating at far too high uh, a level. Um, I mentioned, didn't I, keeping a hot flush diary or a sleep diary. It's great. So, next slide. Um, I'm not going to go into supplements at all today. I don't have time to do that. But one thing I would like to say here is please don't believe anything and everything you read um, or have recommended um, about supplements. There is no single one potion, lotion or pill that will cure all your menopause ills, including HRT. Um, there are some that may help some of the time. You might find again with a friend that uh, black cohosh might help her or sage might help her, but you've tried it and it doesn't work for you. Um, so <laughs> there's nothing, um, there's no, say there's no one that will really, really help. If I was going to recommend one that everyone should take, it would definitely be the omega-3 supplement from a fish oil. You can also get vegan omega-3 supplements now. But I think my underlying um, attention that I want to bring to you here where supplements are concerned well two things actually they are never to be used as a substitute substitute for a natural varied diet um, three things ensure the quality you do tend to get what you pay for and thirdly ask advice from someone who is trained in supplements in supplementation and if you're on prescription medication, someone who is trained in supplementation and knows their interactions um, with any uh, prescription drugs you are taking, just because you, it says natural, just because you believe it's natural, does not mean it's safe. So please be cautious where supplements um, are concerned. 
couldn't resist this one because, you know, it is positivity after all that's um, <laughs> the, the reason why we're all here um, tonight uh, is, you know, really, really important to know your menopause. And in the science module, I, I do focus um, on quite a lot of the information that we've put in the support pack. Um, I really want to stress how important it is to do your research, do as much research as you can, become as well informed as you possibly, possibly can about menopause and how it can affect you. It doesn't mean to say that what you read will affect you. It doesn't have to be the truth, but do your research and find out as much as you possibly can um, about menopause. And talking to other people is a great way of doing that. Um, log your own symptoms. Um, the importance of that is we found doing the positivity um, um, poll that Hot flushes are certainly not the most common of menopausal symptoms that drive women to see their GP. It's anxiety and depression, um, fatigue um, and poor sleep that come first above the hot flushes. Uh, so logging your hot flushes, monitoring them and going armed to see your GP with that information can help both you and your GP determine what may be going on in the body because not all symptoms may be menopausal. Um, it may be that the GP thinks something else needs investigating as well. So log your symptoms and when you do go to see a GP, always, always, always be prepared. Write down the questions that you want to ask. We've given some suggestions again in the support pack. Um, they may work for you. You may want to ask different ones, but go prepared. Um, you need to go and come away feeling that you've been heard, that you've been understood, and that you've got the advice and support that you personally need. So it's really, really important to know your menopause. And if you don't have the support pack yet, it's easy to do. You just download it from positivity.co.uk. And um, uh, has anybody got anything they'd like to ask? I, can I be indulgent and ask one question, please? Um, because this follows on from something Dr. Shazadi said, which was there was somebody who was talking about they had breast cancer, so they were taking phytoestrogens mm. and she warned against taking too many. Is it possible to overdose on estrogen? Like if you're taking HRT and you start taking phytoestrogens as well or increasing them in your diet, will that have an impact? Right. OK, it's a really good question. And I tried to cover a little bit of it in there when I was talking about those alpha and those beta receptor sites. So the thing with estrogen is there's more than one different sort in your body. Estrogen is a collective term for different estrogens um, in your body and they work in different ways. They go through, they're metabolized in different pathways in the liver and they attach to different receptor sites. Now, some of those receptor sites that can be HRT sensitive, the alpha ones, are the ones that could be considered to contribute towards breast cancer, um, bowel cancer, um, and other hormone-related hormone cancers as well. But the beta ones are considered to be protective. And research is suggesting that phytoestrogens are attached to the protective beta receptor sites. Can you have too much? Possibly, probably. Oh, I don't know <laughs> the answer to that. I have no idea. Um, why would anybody want too much of them? Um, you know, you can include them in your diet and you can see if they help you a little bit with, um, with symptoms. Um, but I can't think why anybody would concentrate their diet just purely on phytoestrogens. It would be very limiting as well to start with. Um, not everybody can eat all those, um, those products anyway. There's beans and pulses and chickpeas. For a lot of people that causes digestive issues. So including them in your diet is great, um, but um, I wouldn't recommend anybody focus purely on those. Does okay. that answer your question? Yes, it does. I was just wondering if it was like possible to have too much, you know, and like, uh, yeah, just I, off what I Dr. Shazadi said. As part of, a, as a part of an all embracing diet, um, I would suggest no. Fantastic. Yeah. And we have, um, is it Deborah? Sorry, um, sorry if I've got your name wrong. Would you like to unmute? Because you've got a couple of great questions. 
Uh, it's Diane, yes. Diane, uh, sorry, uh, Diane. Well, you're okay, you're okay, don't worry, don't worry. I, I answer to most things. Uh, so, I've been <laughs> so do I. A lot of things <laughs> Thank you. That was a really good talk. Um, oh, thank you. Really, really good. Thank, and I'm really pleased you mentioned um, the fact that there can be interactions uh, with some of the supplements as well and uh, with medication. And um, I've seen a lot of people waste a lot of money on, on supplements as well. So that's great. But those aren't my questions. Uh, so <laughs> I was just wondering, because um, nuts, I love nuts and I, I always struggle with my weight. So for me, I think that nuts are great to grab hold of, you know, as you say, for the phytoestrogens. Um, but are there any nuts that are better than others? Um, you know, are there uh, ones that I should, uh, you know, stock up on um, as a snack rather than other ones? Or like, so for example, peanuts, you know, uh, you know, most people would probably have peanuts in the house, but I'm not sure if that's good. <laughs> great question. Um, peanuts are, are a pea, they're not a nut, just to be really pedantic there. Um, I don't class those as nuts, but um, it's a really, really great question there. And a lot of people avoid nuts. Um, I'll talk about seeds in a sec. Avoid nuts because they're considered to be high in calories. Um, they all offer something slightly different. They do contain really high levels of uh, lots of minerals and vitamins, and including fats, the good fats. For example, Brazil nuts is full of selenium. Um, for anybody using them as a snack, I would suggest not to have more than a palmful um, of any nut. Um, so with a Brazil nut, for example, that might be four or five, you know, just to cover the palm of your hand. Um, so um, don't overdose on those because you can, it, it's like everything, you can have too much of a good thing. So it's always, always, always about finding the balance. And where nuts are concerned, don't have more than a um, handful. And you, it's, is any one better than the other? No, not particularly. Just get the varying levels of minerals and vitamins in them. So just mix them up and have the mixed ones. However, um, I would suggest if it's almonds, you must soak your nuts. And I say that to men, I don't know why they raise their eyebrows really. But anyway, <laughs> yes, so you must, <laughs> you must soak your nuts if you're eating the almonds. And the reason for that is on the outside of an almond, this is a great experiment to do actually, on the outside of an almond, there is a brown covering. Um, and that covering is an enzyme inhibitor. And that's to stop the birds pecking away at the, the nut. But you don't want to be having that enzyme inhibitor. And by the time those, that's point one, point two is by the time those nuts get to you, they're really, really dehydrated, really dehydrated. So you should always soak the nuts for a few hours or overnight and then rinse them a couple of times to get rid of that um, covering. Now, my little experiment for you is, little challenge for you is, if you take a dozen um, nut um, almonds, uh, take a dozen almonds and then another dozen almonds, another dozen almonds and put them in water and leave them overnight. I'd love to hear what you find as the difference between the two um, bowls. So same two bowls, exactly the same size, a dozen in dry in one, a dozen covered in water in the other. And let us know what the difference that you see after you've soaked them overnight. Wow. That, that is revolutionary. <laughs> Good. Um, see, Thank you. Um, I'm I'm actually prefer the nutrients from seeds to nuts, okay. um, and but not whole seeds. So grind the seeds. So get a mixture of different seeds. Um, flax seeds. You don't actually have to grind chia seeds. Flax seeds and chia seeds are really high in those omega threes that I mentioned, um, but they've got a really hard outer covering. So when you're taking the seeds whole um, they kind of like go from A to B and they act like little mini sandblasters and get into all the nooks and crannies of your digestive tract of your bowel and really beneficial because they clean it out and get rid of all that impacted feces and meat produce that might be fermenting in there just thought I'd throw that in um, and um, so they're really good whole but they're, they're much more powerful if you grind them. So if you've got a, like a coffee bean grinder or something, um, any sort of grinder, just throw in a load of 
mix seeds, it doesn't really matter what, um, grind them up, do bear in mind they will expand, don't overfill that, that coffee bean grinder, I've done that a few times, um, and then just sprinkle them on anything and everything. That's useful. I, I, I have um, chia on my porridge. I, I feel like I, I start the day OK uh, and then it goes downhill. But I do have chia seeds on my porridge, so I'll, I'll do that in the future. Thank you. Yeah, you don't need to break. You don't need to grind the chia seeds. They're so small anyway. And actually, they're, they're, they really are high in omega threes without having to break into them. OK, OK. Thank you. Did you have another question? Oh, well, really, I, I have tried so many times to take different products to get away from dairy you're absolutely right dairy does give me mucus and i constantly have a uh, clear my throat when i have dairy and i have tried um so soy milk i have tried um almond milk i have tried uh, soya beans which i absolutely love and soya products like the yogurts and for example. Yeah. Um, but what I find is that I end up extremely gripey. My GI tract does not like it. And I, what I just wondered was, I have never seen the list that you put up before with all the phytoestrogens in it. So that was amazing. Can we get enough from the other products that you listed? So I have broccoli, I'll have carrots, I have, um, what else was on that list? Um, bleh, lentils. So can we get enough from those? Because I've always yeah. been led to believe that soya is the biggest sort of contributor. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, it, it is, and it's the most well-known um, phytoestrogen. Um, and um, you can use it a lot. It's, it's used a lot in food processing. So it's used as an emulsifier. Um, but, you know, the edamame beans and the miso that, that come from a bean, they won't be genetically modified. So they won't have gone through any food process. So keep on with the, the beans and keep on with the, um, if you're using miso, then use that. You can use that as seasoning as well um, in stuff or even just has it, have it as a soup. Um, so um, enjoy that, but just don't go overboard on soya products that are genetically modified because it's, it, it's just used. It's a bit like corn, corn syrup, just used in absolutely everything and there's no nutrient value. And my concern is, that women who believe that to be the best phytoestrogen and, and focus on that um, may be doing themselves more harm than good if it affects their thyroid. That's, thank you, that's really helpful. You're welcome. You. Just checking, I'm unmuted. Gisela, Gisela has a question. Hello, that's me. Oh. <clears throat> Hi. Um, so about 11 years ago when I was in my mid-30s, I found I had fibroids. Um, so, and I've only just discovered that apparently eating soy products can make it worse. Um, so, yes, I was just checking if that's something to avoid then if you have... Because also I hear that fibroids can shrink um, oh, well. after menopause as well. So. Yeah, they're estrogen fed. Um, and I have to admit, hand up, that I am not 100% sure if the beta um, receptor sites are sensitive, or fibroids are sensitive to those beta receptor sites. So it's a good question, Zella. <laughs> I will write it down um, and... I'm, I'm very happy always to say I don't know the answer to everything. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so I can't do that. Other than to say that for sure, fibroids are estrogen fed. Mm -hmm. And as you go through the menopause and estrogen eventually drops, then okay. those fibroids should shrink. And hopefully that will happen before you ever have to have them out. Okay. Um, but I will just make a note of that if that's okay. Sure. Fibroids and beta receptor sites estrogen and i just had one other yeah, small sure. question um i was taking um an oil by a company called viridian um oh, yeah good and it was called women's oil for 40 plus but it had three six and nine yeah. and i just wondered whether i know you talked about importance of three i just yeah. wondered six and nine equally important yeah okay. okay so it's like i mentioned before um, everything in balance and so six and nine are vitally important to us as well the problem with 
and I'll use this as a, an example for you. So omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. So if you've got any inflammatory in your condition, omega-3s attach onto receptor sites that reduce that inflammatory condition. Omega-6s, though they're also an essential fat, it's essential we give them to our body, um, promote an inflammatory response in the body. Now, if you've got a two to one ratio, that goes even three or four to one, omega-6 to omega-3, that's absolutely fine. Um, and you know the body goes along hunky-dory because it's got it in the right balance. The problem is in those central aisles in the supermarket, they use products with omega-6s um, to go through that food processing. So it's too easy to get omega inflammatory omega-6s um, in our body. So if you came to me and I assessed your um, dietary intake, I would look at where you were buying your foods from, basically. And I would be considering in my head, have you got an imbalance of sixes to threes? And if I thought that was the case, um, and we discussed something together, I would encourage you to reduce those omega sixes um, in any way. But they are necessary, particularly through menopause, uh, through the perimenopause, particularly. Um, but you cannot overdose on the omega threes. Okay. So that, that's why I always put the emphasis on the omega threes. You're going to get the omega sixes. The omega sixes are in those nuts and seeds that we talked mm. about. Um, they're in all the vegetable oils or the, or the yeah, the, the vegetable oils that you're actually using in your cooking that are in the foods that you're eating. So park the omega sixes. You should be getting enough in your diet, although I would prefer that you got them not from the, not through a food processing. Okay. Does that? And, yeah, and, and the nine similarly? Is what, uh, the nines, the nine? yeah, we need the nines. Olive oil is lovely, oh, okay. we don't need that as well. So um, again, you don't have to have it in excess. It's, it's the three that's the most important for your bone health, your cardiovascular health, your brain health, um, the apples for your apple pie, the hormones. Um, so yeah, that, those are the ones that People don't have enough of because a lot of people don't eat fish and they don't like the oily fish. Okay, I get that. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Um, we have a question from Joe as well. Joe, we will be putting this video on YouTube so you can check out the slide on phytoestrogen foods again once it's up there and we'll no doubt be sending links to everything as well. But Joe has a question for you as well that I am really interested in. Ooh. I just wanted with it, Joe. <laughs> to ask, um, is it true that when you come off HRT, you can end up putting weight on? I um, I went through the, the menopause probably just about 40, and I was on HRT for a, a, at least about 10 years. But at one stage I had come off and, and the doctor kind of said, your, your symptoms will all come back and you'll beg me to put you back on the HRT stuff which did happen. I did go back and it because my quality of life without it was was pretty poor. I was quite, um, I felt like I was going mad. I just wanted to scream at times and stuff like that. So I have come off to HRT now um, and I've, I've been off it maybe a couple of years. I have put an awful lot of weight on, particularly in around my belly and, and that area. And I do exercise and I do yoga and I do quite a lot of things. But I just wondered, can that be part of the hormone imbalance? And, and what can I do about it if it is? <gasps> do you know, I wish I had the answer to that, Joe. <laughs> I, would, I would be very, very, very wealthy and rich and uh, well-known and this, that and the other. OK, so. And, and is it true, though, that, you know, when you come off HRT, you can put on weight? Is, is that actually true or is yeah. it? Is it a factor for me? That's what I'm asking, because I am trying to, to lose it, but particularly in that area of my body, I would say. Yeah. OK. Um, yes. Um, your, even the slimmest of women, their body shape will change as they go through menopause. You'll find that they, they perhaps don't have the, the waist going in at all or as much. They tend to become expand a little around the waist, so they're, they're wider. Um, from side to side and they're possibly wider in depth as well than so from front to back so even the slimmest of women their body shape does change um, is there that inevitability yes in a way that there is there is um, and one of the reasons for that is that 
um, inside every cell in your body, particularly fat cells, there are estrogen receptors. And so there you are, there's a little, little cell there. Whoops, there we go, there you go. There are estrogen receptors. And um, there are different sorts of estrogen in your body, like I mentioned. Uh, and as your estrogen levels fall, your body desperately, desperately wants to hang on to as many as much of this estrogen as it can basically because it knows that it's needed for so many good bodily um functions um yeah mm -hmm. good good things going on so it wants to hang on to it so it hangs on to it and it attaches it to these eastern estrogen receptors there we go estrogen receptors inside this cell um and so because it, your body never ever works against you it always always works for you you might not like the way it's working for you but <laughs> it is doing that so it's hanging on to these estrogen receptors and it doesn't want to let go um and so, yeah and they're they're stored in fat cells basically so your body is more inclined to hang on to those fat cells so whatever you did in the past to lose weight however much exercise you did um, and never, ever cut your calories down, by the way. That sends that body into a huge stress with your stress bar woo, right, going okay. sky, sky high. Um, whatever you did in the past to work, you'll find that it possibly find that it doesn't work for you now. Um, mm -hmm. So in answer to your question, there, there is a, an inevitability that your body shape will change and you will hang on to more fat cells. Right. What I say to my clients is, you have to accept that this is a different transition in life. Your body shape has changed from birth to childhood through puberty. Um, maybe if you've got children through um, childbearing years, this is a different stage in life. And though we might not like the changes that are happening to our body, then we have to accept to some level that, you know, it is going to change. Okay. If you don't want, to, you can make a difference. It's hard work. Um, and then you might be disappointed that you're not getting making the difference that you're look, wanting to see. Uh -huh. I know that if you embrace even just some of the things that I've um, spoken to you about tonight, that if you embrace some of those things and take back control, it's it's not just your body; it's how you feel that's so important. Um, so losing weight, I ask people to lose weight, how will they feel? And they say, "Oh well, I'll feel more confident," and this, that, and the other. But actually. You don't have to lose the weight to get that feeling and that emotion. So doing something to help yourself can help you gain the, the confidence, the self-worth, the looking in the mirror and feeling good about yourself without having to lose um, lots of pounds. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's great. That's helpful. It's, um, I've been one of these people who's always been, been quite thin all my life and didn't really have to work that hard of it, but I'm always quite active and I've just noticed that the change really coming now. Um, but, but it's part of it's inevitable. So well, can I there. also, yeah. can I also just say, I was looking at your stuff with real interest, but, um, I do a, a type of yoga called Drew Yoga. Mm. And it specifically does your your mind, body and your health. And just for your first three points in your slide for the relaxation, for the breathing, for the body scan and the yoga, it's I would recommend it to folk. I, I've actually felt it's so good that I'm actually doing the teacher training. But it was just to say it's a specific type of yoga that does all of these things. And I have found it wonderful. I found oh. it's really made a big difference to me. Thank um, you it, for sharing that. Yes. What was the name again, Joe? D R U. D R U. I've not heard of that. D R U Yoga. Okay. Um, have a look at some of the stuff, but it's particularly focused on your mind and your body and your kind of spiritual self. Brilliant. Um, but they they do a lot of breathing and different breathing techniques, and I've found that really good. So it's just just to share it there with you. Thank you. Thank that, you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, any more, Liz? Yeah, we have one last question, which I have to read out because Siobhan's microphone isn't working. But I do want to say, Joe, if you go back and look in our YouTube site, Adele Martin did a great okay. video, a great presentation on keeping fit and weight management as well. Oh, it was really interesting. We had so much good feedback from it. So check out Adele's video as well. That was really helpful. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, this is just the first one I've seen and joined, but I've, I've, I've found it really good. Uh, so I've, I've, it's just towards the end when I, I discovered it. So I'll do that. Thank you. 
Um, and finally, Siobhan, this is a, a great one. Do you have any thoughts about the idea that a lot of Western meat-based, high-fat, low-fiber diets means women have higher levels of estrogen compared to, say, Japanese women? So when they reach menopause and estrogen, um, when they reach menopause and estrogen production solves, it's more of a shock to the body. I read somewhere that in Japan, there's not much evidence of hot flushes, for example. Okay, they don't have a word for menopause in Japan. Mm. It doesn't exist in their mindset. Okay, good question. I'll try and make it brief. <laughs> Never been known. <laughs> just put my feet up here, I think, and just get ready. Okay, so um, they eat a lot of natural soy products in um, Japan and Asia generally, and they don't tend to suffer so much they don't eat a huge amount of meat or as, uh, the, as we do in the Western world. Um, and uh, if they do have meat, um, it is, it, it's minimal, it's minimal. And it's, it's much better quality actually than, than what we have. Having said that about the quality, I must stress that the quality we have is far, far better than the quality that they have in the States. I personally wouldn't eat meat, of any meat that has come in from the States. Their conditions that they keep them in on these huge farms, the hormones that they pump them full of, um, the way that they treat them, et cetera, et cetera, is not going to serve our health. So I, I hope that, because that was a long question for me to remember, you know, brain fog and everything. And um, I hope that answers that parks that bit about um, women um, in Asia, particularly um, with their symptoms. The, I think the diet you prescribed, Siobhan, um, is um, more keto. Is that what you were thinking? Do you want to, can you nod your head or, <laughs> oh no, you blanked out. Um, really high um, in meat, um, I can't remember, did you say high or low? Was it high or low fat, Liz? Sorry, I muted myself. Uh, high fat, high meat fat. based, high fat, low yeah. fiber diets, do they yeah. mean that we have higher levels of, of estrogen? estrogen. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it sounds more like the keto diet. Um, I'm not a great lover of it um, for a number of reasons. Um, does that mean we have more estrogen? Not if you get your um, animal produce from a good source. Uh, I would recommend to everybody eat less meat, spend the same amount of money that you spend now on meat, eat less of it, um, but get the very best quality that you possibly can. Because, um, But I also said that in the UK, meat is kept in much better conditions. So I would look for grass-fed beef sheep pretty much are grass fed um, anyway. Well, when I see them, they are. Um, uh, I don't eat pork um, unless it's organic either. Um, and I certainly would not eat a sad chicken. I only eat organic chickens. So that works out pretty expensive, but I don't eat a lot of it. So I spend the same amount of money, but on better quality because I believe overall, not it's not just the estrogen side of it there. It's it's the overall health side of it that I think that quality and that quantity actually um, contributes towards. So I hope that answered, Siobhan. Well, as Claire has now started a trade war with the US when Brexit <laughs> negotiations are going so bad, I think we better wrap up there. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Claire. I, I always, always learn from you. One of the things I loved about Claire was when I wanted to come off HRT earlier this year and go natural, the first thing she said to me was stay on your HRT until you get settled and then do it. And that's when I knew she wasn't a fraud because it would have been so easy for her to say, yes, come off it. Just, you know, eat all the things I say and the fact that she didn't and she gave me really, really honest advice and always gives me honest advice is, is, something I treasure so thank you and thank you for tonight oh you're um, very welcome thank you everybody a huge yeah a huge thank you to everybody who's joined us not just tonight but for the past few weeks we were so nervous starting this 
Um, and we thought it would be me and Claire and perhaps my mum, if she ever got round to working at Google, <laughs> how to do it. Um, and it's been great. And as you said, we're getting loads of comments saying, yes, please, to a monthly one. So definitely, we've enjoyed doing it. We've loved meeting all of you. Um, and that's about it, really. Thank you all so much. Oh, yeah. get your posters for World Menopause Day as oh, yeah. well on Sunday. Uh, positivity.co.uk if you haven't been able to make any of the talks or you've missed any they're all going up on our YouTube site this one should be up this weekend so check us out on positivity know your menopause subscribe I feel like such an influencer now yeah <laughs> that's it and your work to Claire just say thank you you're very welcome. And thanks, ladies. Um, it's been a great experience. Well, it's been an experience um, doing the last six weeks. Um, uh, but yeah, we have thoroughly enjoyed it. We were very nervous, but it has been great. And, uh, and you know, we have to thank you for, for that. So yeah, my, my thanks too.